Romani is a sports journalist, sports personality, sports pundit uh, for ESPN. Uh, he's been on the Dan Levitard show. He is also has his own radio show and podcast. He has the Right Time with Romani Jones, which is every day from four to seven. That's right. That's right. Until the end of, until the end of the month. Until the end of the month. <laughs> right. Uh, he also has the Evening Jones, um, which you should check out. And he also writes for the Undefeated. He also writes for the Undefeated and ESPN.com. Uh, I'm not going to go through a whole long uh, list of Bomani's background because we want to get into some of that with the interview. So what we're going to do, Bomani is a graduate of Clark Atlanta University. Give it up for Clark Atlanta University. <laughs> what we're going to do is um, discuss the intersections of sports, race, and politics, but also Bomani's background. And we're going to throw it to the audience for you all to ask questions and have dialogue because that's what he's here for the dialogue with us uh, about these issues. Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. So we will get started, all right? Welcome again, Bumani Jones. <laughs> all right, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. All right. Up. So we'll slide over. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you for coming. So. Uh, are you getting a microphone? Or am I oh, do I need a microphone? Oh. Can you all hear me? Sorry, we yeah. don't need yeah. a microphone. Let's, let's begin with your background first, all right? You are now a sports journalist, right? Right. You did not major in that. No. You majored in economics. Okay. So how? Tell us. Tell, tell us. How did you come to this uh, part of your life? All right. So let's start with. The, uh, I'll try to make this the short version okay. as possible because we went through all these different things. I'm also Mac and Barbara Jones' son, which doesn't necessarily mean that much to people here, but it's kind of as I'm here, and it's Kelly who is one of my father's students. I don't come this far north during the winter. <laughs> That's not really how I do this. But um, I I went to college, and if I took count, I think I majored in five different things while I was in college because I didn't have much of an idea. I started in chemistry, and then I went to history, and I got out of history before I even took a course. Like it was like, oh, this sounds like something I might want to major in. And then I was like, okay, maybe not really. I took an economics course. I was like, yeah, okay. I think I wound up majoring in this, and then I did a couple semesters of that, and was like, nah, I don't want to do that. And then I decided I was going to major in English, and the whole reason that I was going to major in English was that I had finished my junior year, and I did the math, and it would require me to take two more full years of classes, but no more than 14 hours every semester, which sounded like a really easy way to spend two years. And I knew that graduating from college earlier than I had to was hustling backwards in epic proportions, because this was as much fun as I was ever going to have in life. So I was not trying to get out of the fun part of life to go into this other part of life that isn't nearly as much fun. Um, then a couple things happened, and I was like, all right, cool, we get this degree in economics. So I finished in economics, I graduated, and it was the question was like, what are you doing after graduation? I was like, well, the one thing that I'm not going to do after graduation is I'm not taking any more economics classes. I'm done with that. Three months later, I am in a master's program in economics. Um, I, I, like, when all you have is what you're not going to do, then what you are going to do becomes this big world. And then I wound up, somebody called me about a fellowship. And I remember, I was like, okay, it was the middle of August. And they asked about this fellowship. And I said, okay, cool. Well, I mean, I guess you guys want me to be there in January. They're like, no, 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 no. Semester starts in two weeks. And I looked around and I called my parents, and they're trying to get me out of their house. And they're like, I think this is a good idea. You know, they put a credit card in my hand and sent me out there. 
And by the time I got done with that, I was like, okay, I think I could stand to do a PhD in economics. And so I went to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And it wasn't long after I started doing that that I realized, nah, 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 this ain't for me. Um, now, I didn't have the courage to walk away myself. So instead, I walked out. Um, yeah, I let, them, I let them make the decision with me slash for me, however it went. Well, it was just really, economics graduate study is applied math in a way that I didn't think that that was what I was signing up for. I thought I was signing up for something more qualitative. And then I'm there, and we're cranking out math every day. And, I, and the math that doesn't come with numbers, right? Just letters and Greek stuff. Like, that's what I was doing the whole way. It's like, this is not, this isn't it. But I left and I didn't have a plan, but the right thing had been going for a while. And it really got going at that point, and that's when ESPN, it's 2005, and ESPN called me. And I just worked with them for a couple of years, and then they fired me. And then I did, started doing radio, worked at a radio station, that went well, and then the radio station went out of business. And then I went to another radio station, and then they went out of business. Um, and then five years later, I'm sitting here in front of you. Like, that was kind of where the change was. But I had just done a broad academic program of sorts, and then from there, it was just a matter of what can I do? after I get out of here. And I got lucky. I met Ralph Wiley in 2003, who for my money is the greatest sports writer who ever lived. And he told me at some point that he was a fan of my work, which is the most flattering thing that any human being has ever told me. Like, after he told me that, there's really nothing the rest of y'all can say. You know, like, if I, you know, fire me. Okay, Ralph said I was dumb. You know, like, this, like, this doesn't matter. But that's just really kind of how I got in it, was I started doing a bunch of jobs I had no experience at doing, and I was probably wildly underqualified for, and it dawned on me, it's their job to figure out who to hire. You know, like, if they fire me, that's fine, you messed up, you know, but that's kind of how it went. Did you started, did you write for Black Voices? Yes. Why you in college? I, well, it was Africana.com when I was in college, and then AOL bought them, but yeah. So you started writing, did that help you segue into sports writing with yeah, because it well, helped me segue into sports writing because it was writing, yeah. you know? So I started doing just kind of like, right, like observational, worldly kind of stuff. And then I really focused more on doing music criticism, which is still my favorite thing to do. And every now and then I write something on sports. And so the way I actually, the way I wound up getting into sports was, there was a story about this kid named Marcus Dixon who went to school, I think it was in Cartersville or Rome, Georgia, one of the two. And he had caught a um, sexual assault charge that was a bit trumped up. And I remember the story started going national, and I was on an email. Ralph had sent this email, I remember, it was to me and Michael Wilbon. And it was the craziest thing in the world to me that I was on the same email list with Michael Wilbon. And so he sent that to me, and I remember I sent him something, and I said, well, look, you know, I used to work at the Georgia Department of Law. If you got some people down there you need to talk to, let me know. I'll try to connect you. I'm trying to show off my little connections to this dude. And then two days later, I got an email from an editor at ESPN.com who said, well, we hear you're pretty good at this, and Ralph says that you could probably write this. So we were just wondering if you would do it. So rather than he take my little offer of assistance for him to do it, he's like, nah, you go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I'd ever like really written for money about sports was on ESPN.com at the recommendation of you know, the baddest man in the room. Right. You said something on the way over that's very interesting. I'll just segue to, to this issue about the intersection of sports politics and radio. You said that when you're, you're doing this work, you get on ESPN, and your father was just happy that you weren't a seller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so talk a little bit about your, your, your background with your father, because you, your name is Romani. Yes. That's not a name you gave yourself. Right. Your brother is Patrice Lumumba. Yes. <laughs> and you know, if y'all don't know who Patrice Lumumba is, we talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so explain a little bit about who your father and your mother are, and how that informs your um, take on sports and politics. Yeah, so um, my father, and I find, I have to be careful about this because I find I talk a lot more about my father and these things than my mother, but my mother, I think one interesting metric that you can use on people of a certain generation in determining like who and what they are is like kind of where they went to school and in what time. So. The story of uh, the lady with the hats in Florida, Frederick Wilson, the guy did the thing with Trump. I remember the thing I looked at people and told them was that woman got a master's degree from the University of Miami in 1971 or 72 or something like that. And they wouldn't let just anybody walk in that door, you know, funny hats and all, right? Like they wouldn't let just anybody else in the door at that time. My mother graduated from the University of Oklahoma in 1963. Right. Like, I think she got in, I think, like three or four years after OU had been integrated, and she was. Um, 
as a teenager at the front of the sit-in movements in Oklahoma City. So um, if we go to the Kanye West catalog, where he talks about his, his mother getting arrested in sit-ins, my mother was the face of those sit-ins in Oklahoma City at that time. Um, my father is a, and she's an economics professor, she just retired, she was the dean of business at Alabama a &M. My father uh, went to undergrad at Southern University and got himself promptly put out of school for sit-ins and protests of voting. He now has an honorary degree um, from Southern. Uh, he is the, I believe, founding president of the Conference of Black, of black Political Scientists. And so, for a particular wing of black political scientists in this country, he is kind of the the next time. Yeah, right, right. Like, there's that you put him on a chart and you can draw lines across the right. all reads the world and everything else. It kind of starts in this program, PhD program at what was then Atlanta University that he founded, where the basis of the program was to study the struggle and plight of oppressed people in the United States. And he tells a story about them getting the grant from the Ford Foundation. And the Ford Foundation, before giving them money, needed to be sure that they were not subsidizing mediocrity at the expense of excellence. So they had to explain to the Ford Foundation people why it was that their money would be better spent with Atlanta University than it would be spent at Harvard or anywhere else. And so they developed this scope of a program to study black politics in the United States and around the world. Your father has an article that still must read for political scientists called the Responsibility right. of Black Political Scientists to the Black Community. Yeah. So do you, you feel like how does that sense of responsibility hit you? Does it? In terms, of, in terms of the work you do? Well, it's kind of a yes and no thing. Because for me, I, I feel it is important. White people got the right to not care about anything other than themselves. Right. And then we got the right to not care about nobody but ourselves also. If that's what you so choose to do. So like, that's why I look at Michael Jordan, for example. Michael Jordan does not care about anybody other than Michael Jordan. And it is his right to only care about Michael Jordan if he wants to. By the, other, only by the same token, we have the right to judge him to some degree. But we deserve the right to be as selfish as we want to be in that way. Not everything, I don't think it's fair to ask people to make everything that they do to be a statement on everything else. That's a burden that's taken a lot of people out early in their lives because it's a burden that most people aren't asked to bear. That being said, I feel like I have a responsibility to be honest, if nothing else. And I don't think that you can be honest about the situation as it relates to black people or the situation as it relates to women or just any, generally any other group of marginalized people you can't be honest about it without being frank about what that struggle is, about what the state of affairs is that holds people back and holds people down in those ways. So for me, the job that I do, I think there's an obligation to the truth. And the obligation to the truth as it relates to black people is one, not just of our, it's a struggle, sorry, of our struggles, of our successes and everything else, but it is a requirement for me to be honest to the larger job to do that. Now, is that my same responsibility to black people? I can say personally, yes, I do feel that to a degree that there are things that I can do for everybody else that while I'm here, I can do that. But I also feel that it is in large part my choice to go about these things in that way. And you know, the, 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 the domain of sports has changed in terms of how we even talk about sports. So this discussion of sports, politics, and race really I think is appropriate. Um, even today when we look, Kevin Durant makes his comment uh, that basically saying, if I wasn't an NBA player, y'all wouldn't really love me or care about me. Um, can you talk about that a minute? How, uh, do you think that that's uh, a feeling that many black athletes have, whether it's NBA, or NFL, or anything? Do you think many of them feel that way? I think a lot of them do. I can't, like, I couldn't throw a percentage on it. Yeah. But I think the thing that happened with Kevin Durant, for the NBA in particular, I think two things happened. Thing number one that happened was the decision with LeBron James. And I don't care what anybody says, I love the decision. The decision, <laughs> the decision <laughs> of flex. No matter what anybody says, here's why people got mad at the decision. LeBron stood up in front of the world and said, I am such a big deal that I am going to put on a TV show to tell you where it is that I am going to play basketball. And y'all care so much about me and what I do, and you are going to sit at your house and you are going to watch me tell you where it is that I'm going to school. And was it arrogant? Arrogance, by definition, implies overconfidence. It's only overconfidence in what you're saying is not true. We sat down and we watched. And he ain't even bothered to put on a suit, right? Like he just put on a shirt and some jeans, and he sat down in front of the world. And we sat there through all the commercial breaks. We sat there through the show that spoke to what his greatness was, that was yeah. produced for this reason. We sat down and we did that whole thing. 
And I am convinced that the biggest problem that people had with the decision was that he was right. That they knew that they were sitting there the whole way and they're like, who is this guy? Who does this guy think he is having a TV show to say where he's going? Yeah. <laughs> and we watched it. Yeah. And I think a lot of people really had a resentment of the fact, not just that he did it, but that you had to cop to it in the end. <laughs> Y'all yeah, watch. Right? And so we all sat there and we watched it, and then we had the aftermath of what the decision was, the way that he was treated by the people in Cleveland and everything yeah. else. And I think that was a reminder for a lot of people. I think a lot of them probably didn't even know it. That, whoa, wait a minute. So what you're saying is they don't actually love me. Hmm. Right? Like, what you're saying is that this is all purely about what it is that I can do for them. Mm -hmm. I think that that put that in, like, starkly in people's faces that that would happen. Yeah. Then the other thing that happened was Donald Sterling. Yeah. Yeah, and then when they heard the way that Donald Sterling talked about them. Now, people who played for the Clippers were aware of Donald Sterling, I think, largely. You know, there's all kinds of stories about what it was. But I felt like those are two things that, particularly for NBA players, made it very, very clear to them that they were not viewed on any level as partners. They were not, like the fans were not viewing them really as human beings. Some certainly did, but a lot of them did not. And so I think for a dude like Durant, I, where I give him credit is the honesty in him saying, you know, I've been this star basketball player. And you know, yeah, remember Durant went to all these different schools. So he's right. going to these private schools playing ball that are largely white other than the basketball team. And I think he, those kids were probably very nice to him while he was in school and all these things. And he's, you know, I think I had a point in my parlor, a thought process along those lines when I was younger in different ways. Where it's just kind of like, no, man, these things have changed. You know, look at how they treat me. And then he left Oklahoma City. Right. Right. And he's like, oh, oh, wait a minute. I thought you guys said that you loved me. All I want to do is go to another team and better myself. Uh -huh. And then he looked up and realized, no, no, no. In the eyes of a lot of these people, you are a commodity. Right. And so I think that for a lot of athletes, they are observing in a way they had not before, kind of a lack of humanity in the eyes of those who, who consume the product, that I don't think they had a real grasp on really until recently. You know, going back to the Brian Fair, because you know, he even puts out a commercial, well, welcome to the Terror Dome. Yes. And I don't even think people caught that, you know. I thought that was the most mind-blowing thing I'd ever yeah, seen. It was unbelievable. It was though. And I don't know if the, you know, the audience even recognized Welcome to the Terror Dome by Public Enemy, what kind of song that was. <laughs> it really yeah. was a radical, very radical song. And from LeBron to put that in the commercial speaks volumes about where he's <clears throat> Yeah, and I think his mind has probably gone to some different places yeah. than, than it had been previously. Um, because he's another guy where I think, I think it can be interesting for people to compare their micro-level experiences as it relates to race and the people they've been around to like what you did observe in the macro. So I went to school in a town called Walla, Texas, right outside of Houston. If that sounds familiar, Walla County made the news a couple years ago because that's what said Bland got killed. Now, when that happened, I remember a lot of people were coming to me and were just kind of like, man, so what was it like there? And I was just like, I got to tell you, I have overwhelmingly positive memories and experiences from that place. Those people who were there treated me very well. I went back from my 20 year reunion a couple, of years, a couple of weeks ago, a couple months ago, and everybody treated me very well. Like my memories of that place and what that place was are very, very positive. Um, after that, I went to Clark for four years, and like we saw white people, they were lost. Like they just, they just, they don't. Like, that's just not where they were. It's not where they were kicking us. And then after that, I went to school in California, and that was a school that was buying like wall wall white people across the board. And that was very interesting for me because I found myself being looked at and being treated in ways that were not in line with what I had experienced before because I was no longer familiar. Right, nobody knew who I was. Like now, I'm just this 21 year old dude walking around here with a big afro or with braids, whatever it was I was doing in 2001 and 2002, and was being treated accordingly, which was a bit of a shock. But I had like a certain level of optimism that still existed um, from there. Now, man, like I go on Facebook, and some of those people who treated me well, woo, 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 yeah. they have adopted some fairly radical political stances. Uh -huh. they, they are looking uh -huh. at the world in a bit of a different way. And so I just think for a lot of people, it becomes a matter of trying to balance what your experience is in life, which has its own significance, and in a way you could argue to your own life matters more, while understanding overarching like what the state of affairs is. Mm -hmm. And I think the state of affairs has become a lot clearer to people. Mm -hmm. So how do you navigate? How do you, because I mean, really, uh, 
race is always there in America, right? right? Um, and it's always been there in sports, even though we have sports figures throughout history who have kind of shied away from it. Right. Uh, you know, I saw Dr. J came out for the free meat meal thing. Mm -hmm. Dr. J never wow, came that's out. hilarious. But it's hilarious. <laughs> Dr. J never come out for anything. No, but he came out for the free meat meal. Uh, he did. <laughs> wow. so, uh, I'm not even coming out here for the free meat meal. <laughs> so how do you think the landscape has changed? And, 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 uh, how do you address it when you deal with your show on television? Well, the thing we got right now is across the nation, man, people fed up. They fed up with the same things, they fed up for different reasons, but fed up nonetheless. Like if you just if you were to evaluate everything that's going on kind of politically in this, and just like, yo, man, they look like they're fed up. You know? Like like the people that are rolling behind Trump, the explanation that you always get is, man, these people are fed up. And the people on the other end, whether you talk about the Bernie Sanders set of people or, you know, just like generally people of color who get ignored, man, they are fed up. Now, how I would answer, though, how I navigate it, or like how do you navigate having personal relationships with people, but then also this macro level view, I think I would make the argument that you can kind of ask women how they do that, right? Right. So if you, you know, if you evaluate this in the context of the heterosexual woman in America, it involves a whole lot of recognizing macro level problems and like, you know, why she doing? Putting up with him. Right? Like, you know, but, but that's but that's kind of sort of what it is, that you can have an observation of what is right or wrong with the world while also still having significant important relationships with the folks that are in front of you. Right? And it can be hard to do because the folks that are in front of you are going to embody in some way or another the macro level problem. But you can still have that level, you know, they're not going to be perfect, they're not going to get everything right, and you can still have a significant relationship with those people while not being in denial about what the large world is. So what I think happens to people when they're younger and have a lot of these athletes in there, they're looking at what their own personal experience is, and they're like, hey, look how they're treating me, you know? I'm like, oh, you know, they treat me great, what this is. But that'll change what this big old world is right. and how it has to go. So for me, I try in the work that I do to consider what my personal experiences have been with people, the good and the bad, and have some level of understanding of who those people are that you're talking about, while still having this large sample of data that allows you to draw larger conclusions. Now, does every independent observation in the data set match up with the larger conclusion? No. But the, the, the individual data points do not mean that you throw out the whole set. Mm. And that, to me, is kind of the way to look at it. You know, years ago, um, when Nelly went to uh, Spelman yeah. uh, for, for a bone marrow drive, um, and they wanted him to talk about the issues, and, you know, and the women said they felt like he said, just said, shut up and give me a bone marrow. Yes. But he didn't want to have a discussion. Do you think that uh, fans are looking at athletes now in this day and age who are taking these stands uh, really to shut up and play football, or just shut up and play basketball, that they don't want to hear these things. Do you think it's going to hurt these brands at all? Individual or for the teams? Well, it depends on what. So where this gets to be tricky, I came to this conclusion, I was doing a radio show about this a couple months ago, and I could be wrong here, but I, I thought that this was something worth considering. So think about this with the NFL and the Kaepernick situation. I need to read this book. I haven't read it. I've got like I think I maybe forgotten the title of it, but it's a book that looked at the way the NFL has been sold over the years and the way the NFL has been marketed. And one thing that they found in the marketing of the NFL was it really kind of blew up as they started putting more and more patriotism into the patriotism, you know, air quotes, into the broadcast and into the presentation of the game. And this goes back to the 1970s. So we have a post 9-11 push of these symbols all over, but this kind of precedes that. And so what they do, you know, they do the flyovers and they got the big flags that they go out on the field with and everything else. And this is what the NFL uses to sell itself. Like all the leagues other than the NHL because they've got two countries, but all the leagues have logos that are red, white, and blue, for example. Like all this is to like emphasize the Americanness mm -hmm of it all. And so what does the Americanness or what do you get when you push that as like the defining personality value of what it is? Now let's fast forward to the NFL now and you get Kaepernick and others who are exercising some level of protest during this national anthem. That has then been pushed by those on one side to be a protest of the national anthem, um, which it is not really, or a disrespect of the national anthem, which it is not really. Is it a protest of the United States? Yes. 
there's no way around that. Like, you can try to soften that all you want, but it is a protest of the United States. It's a request, at least in my interpretation of those people, that the United States live up to the ideals that people claim the flag and everything else represent. But if they've got put out there that what these cats are doing is disrespecting the flag, and so now you got all the people who are just, you know, oh, I don't know, you disrespect the flag or everything else. And it dawned on me. The NFL is playing a game where they are trying to remind, not so, remind is not the way to put it, but they want you to forget. They want a lot of people to forget that they actually don't like the players very much. Mm -hmm. Right, and so if you put this all around the flag, and all around this red, white, and blue, and you make that the defining aesthetic behind what the games are, you don't think about the actual players. So you look at the NFL, who are the personalities in the NFL that they really push? Quarterbacks. What do the quarterbacks typically have in common? They're the white dudes, right? But the NFL has that the NBA does not have is white dudes that you can put out up front. Good old fashioned all American white dudes that you can put out there. Look who Papa John gets in those commercials that he's had over those years, right? right. Peyton Manning, JJ Watt, this is real like all American type stuff because they're trying to, don't think about these other guys that you right. don't actually like very much. Yeah. They are typically nameless, they are typically faceless, they are typically easily forgotten, right? They pop in and out all the time because the NFL has determined in a very George Wallace sort of way that you hate these players more than you actually like these games. So take, take uh, college basketball versus NBA basketball, for example. If you say you like basketball, how in the world can you say you prefer watching college basketball to watching NBA basketball? Here's the thing, the NBA, you can't avoid who the players are. You can't avoid their personalities. They're too important. It's too small a number of them. You can't ignore any of that stuff. College basketball, you don't have to think a single moment about who those players are. They don't talk very much. They don't do interviews. The coach winds up being the face of it. Right. And the NBA is always trying to figure out how to deal with the reality that people hate the players more than they actually like the games themselves. That's what the NFL's problem is that they've had right now. Is they man, we need to get these players out of the way. People keep thinking about these players. And that's why Trump can play the game that he's playing so easily is that, hey man, you know, these great ungrateful NFL players and this huge segment of the population that jumps behind when he says that because the NFL players are a proxy for black people. They're not just, it's not just specific to say athletes, they are a proxy for black people. And we've had reports, like I'm not, you know, just pulling this out of thin air. We've had reports where people have said that this is why Trump is waging this culture war against these guys because it's actually about black people, not so much about the athletes. So the game in sports for the leagues is to remind you that you hopefully, or just remind you how much you like these games. If you stop thinking about this other stuff, you can enjoy what they do. Just don't think about how much you don't actually like who the people are. Now, how does this relate to the players? Well, they're in a difficult situation because they're partners in, you know, in this league that is attempting to make money, and they find the most successful way for them to make money is to try to make people forget that you dislike them. Right. But what we just talked about, mm -hmm. people fed up, man. Right? People are fed up. Now, what the NBA has figured out is we got a certain segment of the population that we're never going to win over. And they have, by and large, stopped trying to win those people over. Right? The NFL is trying hard to keep those people, to hold on to them. But this is not because the NBA is a more progressive league. The NBA, unlike the NFL, has a rule in place that mandates that you stand for the national anthem. The NBA went around to make sure everybody would be standing for that national anthem. After Chris Jackson. Very yeah, right, right. No, it was before that. That rule had been in place well before that. He was the first person that had like actually actual 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 Right. The NBA isn't any more progressive, but the NBA, to be fair, is always fighting the idea that the league is too black. So they're always trying to figure out what they do. So with the NBA, though, their players are partners. Because they know their players to shut this down. Them boys, if they would have sat down during that Clipper series with Donald Sterling, they'd have shut down the whole playoffs. Mm -hmm. And that was a very real right. possibility mm -hmm. that that could have happened. So they have to take a different attitude and they have to take a different approach. So the NBA players have a little more leeway in how they do that. And I think that some of them are going to be told to stick to sports. Some of them are not going to do it. That's just going to be what it is. But I think in the NBA, they got a fan base that can handle that a little bit better. In the NFL, they don't know what to do. NFL is military type stuff. You're supposed to do what you're told. Mm. I'm going to shut up for a second and open the floor for questions. Hey, how you doing, Monty Big Fan? Appreciate it. Kevin Jackson, I'm a senior here. I'm a local like South Africa Channel Incorporated. Really? I did not know that. Uh, that's why you're wearing those purple and gold beads. That's where they come from. I had no idea. And the keychain. I mean, I was really confused. <laughs> wow. As a big fan, not like I'm going to get shit. I got you. 
Anyway, um, one of the questions that's been um, on my mind that I don't, I feel it's not being discussed enough, and maybe you could shed a little light on it, is the behavior patterns of NFL players as it relates to CTE. Uh, they get these, they're supposed to have this, because they're professional athletes, they expect them to have this certain behavior about themselves because they're professional. But given what they what we do know now about CTEs, shouldn't there be a little bit of cushion, or is the league just trying to say no, you're you're okay and keep behaving like you're supposed to behave, and dismiss the fact that they're having these brain problems, like what we saw with the uh, Rodgers? Yeah, see, this is this is the you talk about Hernandez. Maybe. Hernandez, yeah, yeah. So so here's here's the dilemma that you have here. Everybody got a story, right? Everybody has a story in some form or fashion. And as a result, it becomes difficult just finding the line of how much slack you give somebody for what is universally deemed to be bad behavior based upon what this story happens to be. Now, this story is a very real one, and it's a physiological one. But with the NFL, A, I would make the argument that the NFL actually does cut, in the end, a certain measure of slack in terms of behavior, in that, like, Greg Hardy, for example, was able to come back and get another job. Yeah. <laughs> right? Now, he blew it, and he blew it because he wasn't showing up to work on time. Like, that was the issue, but they, they had that. Here's, here's what I think is more interesting on CTE, and where I think the NFL, we all get it wrong. We talk about CTE as an NFL issue. No, sir, CTE is a football issue. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a big old football issue. Now, one thing the NFL is never going to do is come out and be like, you guys have to understand, our players are brain damaged. Right? Because then you are saying, hey, come watch our game that damages brains. <laughs> and that, and that, that, you ain't going to see that on a poster. All right, nobody's going to use that to sell the games that they are playing. But it's a football issue. My question is about CTE and about NFL players. This is about high school players. It's about middle school players because it's these. It's not even so much the concussions as much as the subconcussive blow. So, like I found, as I got more in this game and I spent more in this industry, started spending more time talking to former football players. Let me show you something: former football players do a lot. What's his name? Like that recall. They yeah. do that a whole lot in trying to figure it out, which stands to reason they've been banging their heads around for a long time. But they've been banging their heads around since they were 13, 14, you know, wow. since they were right. So like, this decision to become a professional football player is not a decision that you make when you're 20. Like, I decided what I want to do for a living in my 20s. Those decisions are made by those cats really in their teens and in early teens in many of those situations. So they're beating their heads in in football for free, in high school for free to do this. They're beating their heads in in college for free in order to do these things. Like that's my concern about this is the NFL. If anybody like with the lawsuits that come down in the NFL, the NFL has a very compelling argument to make when you want to blame them for CTE, which is how do you know these are our concussions? Mm -hmm. Right? Like how do you know these aren't college concussions? Mm -hmm. How do you know these aren't high school concussions? And you take that to a court of law, I think that's a very compelling argument as to why their liability is mitigated to a degree. Because you can't prove that these are our blows that have been doing this, because you've been taking these blows for who knows how long. Like, we want to make football safer, like it ain't football. Mm. Like, I was, how safe can you make the cigarette? That's, mm. that's the question that they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. How safe can you make the cigarette? And they just don't want you to think about the fact that this is ultimately not the safest thing in the world to do. The question is, how long are they going to have people who are willing to continue to play this game in spite of the lack of safety? And the answer is, there will be plenty of people who are still willing to do this because they want to live that life, right? Some of it is the desperation to get out of where you are. But what Ali said, training for the rubber and the jungle, Southern now will be a champion forever. And there are more people who are willing to make that trade that I think we get credit for being. <coughs> the problem is they don't know how miserable that thing's going to be on the back end. Mm -hmm. You can't know it until you get there. It's like graduate school. Anybody been to graduate school, they tell you it's miserable. Like, it's just school. How bad could it be? <laughs> <laughs> right? Really fucking bad. Right? <laughs> it's it's really, really, really bad. But nobody can tell you that until you get there. And I think that's what's happening to a lot of these football players. But now we got more former players who are telling you, like, yo, man, I don't think you want this. Right. right. Yeah. Well, Monty, going back to the protests, has it become just muddled? with everything, I say that because when Kaepernick did it, I was, and excuse me, I was one of those white people that said, hey, you know, white people are getting shot more, you know, what are you doing? But after he did that, I went and did my own research. Yeah, they are, but percentages, no, it's 
not close. Hell, I even went back to Vietnam War how bad it was. Has it just become so muddled now with all, I just don't know anymore what we're protesting. Well, okay, so this is what I would say. I would say that if you were looking for particular explanations behind all these protests, yes, it has become muddled. But what has muddled it is the fact that taking the knee, I think I saw somebody describe it on the internet, as the ice bucket challenge of uh, protests, that it became the thing to do. Like, if there's a problem that you can make an argument about social media and the mobilization that's taking place afterwards, is like, I think the, the, the term hashtag activism is used pejoratively, but there is something to it. The idea that you have to have a symbol of what you do. And the thing with Kaepernick became, well, whatever it is, you got a problem with it. Take the leader of the national anthem. And so then everybody wound up doing this thing and taking the leader of the national anthem. Now, the cats who did it at first were all, by and large, doing this for the same reason. They were all in line with what Kaepernick had done and been an offshoot of that. It didn't, to me, become muddled until Trump went and bombed on football players who were then offended as football players. They weren't necessarily offended over the same things that Kaepernick was offended by. They were, are you gonna talk about football players like that? So like we have Rex Ryan, who works for us now, who had voted for Trump and who was on stage at a Trump rally mm -hmm. in Buffalo, mm -hmm. who then was down on Trump after Trump banged on football mm -hmm. players. Mm -hmm. And so then it did absolutely become muddled. And that's that my point. problem. Yeah. Is what, yeah, I mean, what the heck am I researching now? I mean, well, 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 but I would make the argument there that you can do all like like Google free for everybody, right? Yeah, like, I, I, <laughs> I know I, you're I, saying. Like, I will say this. You're right. If, if you are looking for guidance on your research from football players, you are doomed. No, no, I, yeah, I, no. Like, I don't know if you just heard our brain damage discussion just a second. But, um, I did. You know, I, know I did play earlier. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's be clear. Like I know exactly what you mean and I understand what you're talking about. But I do think that there's been a certain degree of muddling that has happened, but the macro level point is one of American racism, and that has not been muddled. The only thing I think that's happened with the discussion of American racism is, hey man, people don't want to talk about that. That makes people horribly uncomfortable. They, they, are, they are looking at that one like, hey, can we, can we talk about anything else though? People want to find a way to otherize racism in a way that then does muddle it, but I think it's on purpose, not from the people who are performing the protest, but from the people who are outside. You mind just one more? Yeah. You, you talk about the racism like that. Yeah, I'm fortunate enough to have just a banana republic in my family and mm -hmm. friends growing up. Let's say I didn't, and I come here and mainly around you know black people. How do you start that dialogue? Of I just walk up to someone and say, "Hey, what's you know why? What are the protests for? Why why do you feel this way? Why do you you know?" What is it? What's white privilege to you instead of, and I wouldn't know how you live walking down the road or anything like that. How do we start a dialogue between whomever? If you don't have those people in your life, unlike me. Yeah, I would say though, I've, I think that the need for dialogue on some of these things is a wee bit overrated. Okay. And the reason that I feel like the need for dialogue is overrated is so. Natural disaster, I mean, this is an extreme example I'm just trying to use to make the point. Hurricane comes, it's Puerto Rico. Destroys, you know, destroys Puerto Rico, more or less. I mean, I don't know any Puerto Ricans, but I don't feel like I need to go down there and have some kind of dialogue with them about, so tell me, why was that hurricane so bad, right? Like, I don't, like, I don't need that. I feel like there's enough data and stuff that is available in history that indicates that we have a serious problem yeah. with race in this country. I don't think people need to understand the particulars of it. And I think a danger that comes up, uh, and this is where I think white people wind up getting on people's nerves and don't realize it is asking for people to particularize it to them what exactly the problem is. Because what it is, is it feels as though you are asking, you, it feels as though you're being asked to then validate your feelings. Well, well, help me make sense of it. And sometimes it don't matter if it makes sense to me. Like, I, I, this is something that in dealing with issues of gender with women that I've had to come to terms with over time, is that it doesn't always matter if I understand. It doesn't always matter if I agree. You know, but I think that there's enough that we can look at and we can understand that if, if we start with the baseline of black people in this country are treated differently, I don't think we need to get that much more particular than that. I think from there, you can go there and you can kind of figure some things out and go from there. Now, 
the dial here's why I do think the dialogue part is interesting is like the notion of white privilege, which I think is fascinating to discuss. It absolutely exists, but I do recognize the limitations of making that point to other people. So case in point, Davos went the head coach at Clemson. And he got up and railed after the Kaepernick thing, you know, it's very decidedly Southern Christian, we have a sin problem, we don't have a race problem, and he, you know, invokes Martin Luther King erroneously and all these different <laughs> things, right? Yeah. However, Dabo was a walk-on wide receiver at Alabama. Grew up dirt poor without his father there. While he's in college, he and his mama are sharing the same bed. He has then risen through the ranks via the American dream and become the rich football coach that he is today. How do you go tell this white man who slept in the same bed with his mom in college about white privilege? Because he's looking at you and he's like, so tell me what this whiteness did for me. <laughs> right? Yeah. My mom's right here. Tell me what doing, tell me what being white is doing for me. And it's a very difficult sell to that person, the point that you are making, regardless of the fact that your point is correct. Because sometimes you just have a point where you're right and you're just like, there's no way I'm going to be able exactly. to explain this to you. Yeah. And so part of what I think is lost is life's pretty bad for a lot of white people out here too. Right, they're just by like <laughs> natures of poverty and everything else. Life's pretty bad for them too. What they don't get is the possibility of becoming Dabo Swinney after starting in this position okay. is much greater than it is for the analogous person in that same place right. who cannot turn themselves into an NFL player yeah. right. in the way that he happened to be. Mm. That's the part of the dialogue that I'm trying to figure out how to have okay. is with that person because I think that's the person that is the hardest one to sell on this and probably the most important person to sell on this. So understand the plight of that person is very similar to the plight of the person who is in a similar place as them while also being wildly different. Yeah. Thank you. How's it going, Bill? Hey, uh, so after the Janelle Hill suspension and everything like that, one thing I was curious is like you're it seems like you're still not afraid to like, make points that you consistently make on the radio show. I feel like I've heard you say at uh, that point where the NFL tries to make it seem like you forget about you know, how much a lot of people don't like the players. Like, have you ever found yourself looking over your shoulder after something like that happened, or you know, felt the need to like feel to yourself a little bit more, just like navigating that kind of thing after uh, the whole Jamel the whole suspension? So the thing with what happened with Jamel, I don't, I don't think I found the need to filter myself. Okay, so one thing, I didn't need to filter myself after the thing with Jamel because Jamel says something that I would not have said. And I'm not, this is not a judgment of her for saying it. This is me and my personal approach to discussing these things. Once you call someone a racist, conversation over, right? Like, white people in particular, in my experiences, are not equipped to handle the notion of someone that calling them a racist or saying they are racist, it ends the conversation. Now, I was just telling a little earlier, Bill Wins had a line, it don't do too much good to be talking, brother, if ain't nobody listening. So, like, that is something that strategically I do not do. That's purely, and it's just a matter of strategy, because there are people who are racist, and you should be able to tell them that they are racist, but if you want to have a conversation that's after the fact with that person, it's probably not going to happen. So, for me, there was not, like, really a need to filter the things that I was saying at a point. Now, I was a bit worried, and I, you know, talk some people at the company and stuff like this, where I've always felt like as long as I was telling the truth, that I would be all right. And I thought it was fair to ask the question as to whether or not that that was no longer the case after that thing had happened. What might, or the things that I decide to or not to say at points, hey man, sometimes this stuff gets tired. Like they just tire in to actually perform. So I think people was like, you know, you're not afraid to say these things. Yeah, even if I'm not afraid, it's not a lot of fun. Like yesterday we did a whole hour of radio about Michael Crabtree getting his chain snatched. Yeah, okay. And if you ask me if I want to talk about Donald Sterling for an hour, or I want to talk about somebody getting his chain snatched for an hour, it's chain snatched. <laughs> if you had told me that we were going to come in here and do an hour and a half discussion on chain snatching, I'd have drove up here. <laughs> that's the fun. Like, that's the entertainment. This other stuff. So please explain to me the machinations of the life that can often be miserable as a black person. Would you like to talk about that? There's no fun. Like, that's not entertaining. And sometimes it gets to be stressful just kind of dealing with these things because there's no immediate payoff for you. You know, like, I appreciate the appreciation that I receive from people on those sorts of things. But if 
that if race and those things is where the truth happens to be, then that's where you have to go. That's where you need to go. Now, I, I think I've actually talked about politics less since that happened, and it was not because of any edict from the company that I work for or anything. There's not much left to say in this space that isn't obvious. Right? Like, what am I, after, I guess we're now about two years into Trump as political phenomenon. I don't, what do I have to say that is new? What do I have to say that you have not heard? Like, what do I have to contribute to that conversation that is going to be enlightening to you in a way that it had not been previously? We're kind of running out of those things. Yeah. There are not that many of them left. So I find that myself, I talk about some of these things less than I used to, but just for utility and my own personal sanity. But it's not because I'm afraid that somebody will, <laughs> right. it, it ain't I'm afraid that somebody going to do something to me. And for the record, you've never had to change that. I have not had my change. That is, that is, ooh, 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 ooh,
which is the most arrogant thing you can probably do another battle these days. And I go back to stuff that I hated from like the late 90s and it's like, okay, maybe it wasn't so bad, right? Um, the thing about today though is there's a lot of people making a lot of really, really, really good stuff. There's probably more people making really good stuff now than there's a bit. What we have lost though is the value of the comedy because the, and this is something that happens with television and everything else. Now that you have so many different options and so many more things available, you're going to have fewer people that show up at whatever it is. And so there is a value in, there was a value, I think, to having like five channels and everybody's watching the same five channels and then everybody's talking about the same thing the next day. Like it's cool to have the choice to watch whatever it is that you want, but there was also a value in the larger and greater discussion that everyone was having around whatever it is. So like you take like Purple Rain for example. So for people of a certain age, you can talk to all of them about Purple Rain. <laughs> there aren't that many albums now that come out that people can do that with because everything is so fragmented. But the music itself, I think, is much better than people give it credit for. There's more access to tools that people are able to use. And people, I mean, the people are doing really interesting stuff right now. But it's hard to get that feeling of greatness when you're the only person that's in all the greatness. Mm. Hi, how are you? Yeah. Um, you talked about something that I'd like to talk about regarding sports and popular culture and things like that before. You you said that the athletes were commodities. Yeah. So it seems like to me that to get to the root of all the problems that we're talking about, whether it's racism, CTE, or whatever we're talking about today relative to the NFL and sports, um, we have to talk about capitalism. And, and the fact that, um, isn't that the reason why Africans were brought here in the first place? Is to be commodities. And so that nothing has changed. And I turned off my TV a long time ago as a result of this. If you pay enough attention to it, it looks like what we were doing in a slave market 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the way that we talk about who these people are and their value to us. So I'm wondering what kind of um, what kind of comments can you can can you give us that would help us understand that relationship? The relationship of these are but workers, and workers are meant to be exploited, and workers of color are meant to be super exploited in this society. And yet, in what role do we all play as consumers in that exploitation? Bro, I tell you, I saw your shirt when you started talking and got to go, and I was like, ooh, this is, like, this is gonna be a critique of capitalism. <laughs> um, which, I think, it, it, historically, and it kind of ties into, if you know anything about my father, my father would've been, when you started saying that, my father would've been in the back like, yeah, yeah. Boy, keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Like, if my father is a Marxist political scientist, like, he would've been absolutely going. Now, I mention this because there's a whole generation, I think I'm in the last wing of people who remember this, which is a time where there was a real public discussion and room for a public critique of capitalism, just as a notion and what the weaknesses are of capitalism, right? Because I have always said the problem I have in talking about capitalism is I haven't really come up with anything better, and I don't know how it is that you turn back the clock on what it is right now. But there are some things that are emblematic of capitalism and that you are, it's hard to separate, and one of them is the notion of the worker as commodity. <coughs> that it is hard to separate what capitalism is from the idea that when we talk about the factors of production, we're talking about land, labor, and capital, which puts people on the same level as plots of land and as machines. Mm -hmm. There's no way to separate that. And the way that the companies and operations view workers is on the same level as that. And everything that you say about bringing Africans here was to serve the capitalist establishment. Everything about what we were gonna do after slavery was about how do you keep these workers in such a place where they then serve the establishment. Like none of this is done for the worker. The only place where, like, what then gets the rights and everything for the worker is what? The union. The notion of workers coming together, except as a nation, we are so anti-union across the board. Like, I think this is this is one of the rare places left like Chicago where you have some kind of union presence. I'm from the South, where the union is gone completely. The at, it is the at-will employment world is all the way there. And without the presence, I think, of a large, the, the larger union presence in the country, what's been lost, is a large discussion of athletes in the context of workers' rights. Now, where I find that to be interesting is that I could argue that the strongest union in the history of this country is probably the Major League Baseball Players Association. That I think there, has been, there have been few unions, if ever, that have been more unbowed than that one. And it's taken on the establishment that they were you know, on the other side of them 
as strongly as Major League Baseball Players Association did, and they won every dispute that they had from 1960 whatever to 1994. They won every battle that they had with the owners. They struck, they got what they wanted. Owners locked them out, they still got what they wanted. At every turn, because of their willingness to fight at that point, they don't even fight anymore. And it's wild because the most visible unions in the United States, I would make the argument now, are the unions of professional athletes and they lose every negotiation. And the reason that they lose every negotiation is the public is anti-labor. The public roots for the boss they dream of being mm. over the person that they probably are more similar to mm. at every turn. In sports, they root for the millionaire, I mean for the billionaire over the millionaire just about every time. There's a resentment toward the worker that makes it that does not exist toward the person who very honestly may have inherited whatever the money is that they are going to get. Now, with all of that coming together, what we do then end up with is a place where we basically feel like athletes make too much money for us to observe them in the context of being labor, which is what they are. Like, I got a buddy of mine in the industry who talks about, I forget who it was he was talking to. He was like, look, man, Every battle in sports is labor versus management, is owner versus worker. Every single one of them, when it comes down to it, is one of those things. This thing with the players and the anthem, this isn't about the expression of rights. This is management versus labor. That's what that battle is. And Draymond Green had a thing with Cuban where he's just like, I don't like the idea of calling these guys owners. Right. And Mark Cuban lost his mind about that and then talked down to him and said, do you know what equity is? and everything else, you know, all of a sudden you patronize him in every way. When Draymond was making a very good point, mm -hmm. if I'm supposed to be a partner in this league, as we say that we are, we're supposed to be partners, then I don't want, to, I don't want you to talk about me like you own me. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want that to be the case. And the response from the public was overwhelmingly, what well, he does own the team. And I think that most Americans believe that, by, that your own, your, the person who owns your business or whatever has the right to tell you whatever it is. And that's how far gone we are, I think, on the discussion that allows us, even if you're not out here on Viva La Revolucion to burn this whole thing down, an honest discussion about the fact that, yes, we are taking these guys and they're building them up from when they're children to yeah. become these athletes. And they are ultimately commodities for the operations that they work for. They are ultimately viewed in that same context and the value is simply what they can provide to the larger operation while we are asked to venerate and revere those operations right. and then discard of the players that are there that's a real thing and i think it ties into what we were talking about before with as well as with after the decision with lebron and with donald sterling i think there is a new awareness of the way that players feel like they are being viewed i think they see it more than ever but in the macro level, we have totally stopped having these intellectual discussions of capitalism. And since we stopped having those discussions, it becomes harder to have a place to put the proper context on what the relationship truly is between labor and management now in sports. And I hope there's a, another way to come around and figure out how it is to have that discussion. Because, I mean, I guess I don't, I get to work with my mind in such a way where, yeah, I'm a commodity to the machine that I'm in also, just like everybody else is, but it's different when you're not doing it with your body. And those guys are doing it with their bodies, and when their bodies expire, they're gone. Yeah. And since they're doing it with their bodies, when their bodies expire, mm -hmm. you just gotta hope like hell somebody did something with their minds in the first place, they give them something else to do. Otherwise, just use them like the, the other businesses, but they use it till you burn out, busted, and dead. Mm -hmm. Sports ain't terribly different. Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel Wilkins. Uh, so you talk about like capitalism. So with that being said, I wanted to ask you: Do you think that the NBA will go on lockout like within the next four to five years once the new collective bargaining agreement that they agreed to expires? Because just covering the Houston Rockets for HoopsHappen.com, I know that they sold for a record high two point three billion dollars uh, this September. But in order for the bargaining agreement to like fully be agreed upon and take place. The players had to end up taking like less basketball related income. So like what is your thoughts on that? Like do you think that we'll see another lockout in the NBA anytime soon? Especially when players are so much more aware of, you know, how much profit money is just like generated. Well now they've had a renewal in the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. Now and the, the reason that's important to point out is it was my belief that the goal of the previous lockout was to break the union. And they almost did. Yeah. Right, like the goal of that previous lockout was to break the union. 
They didn't break the union. Now, after that lockout, everything was going so well that the owners looked at themselves and looked at each other and were like, okay, we got to keep this money train going. Like, we can't, we, we, we got something that's good right now. Let's keep this thing trucking. And they kept the trucking and they did manage to resign. Now, the NFL, oh, 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 they're about to have an issue. Because all of this stuff with Kaepernick, this is all lockout stuff, man. This is all in preparation of what's going to happen with that CBA. Like when you start seeing the union and management fight over every little thing, mm -hmm. this is all positioning for what's going to happen on this next end of it. Now, here's where I think the NFL labor situation is going to get interesting, and I could be wrong, but there's always a contract that breaks the matrix. There are a lot of contracts that break the matrix. So the NBA lockout of 1999, 98-99, the Kevin Garnett contract broke that major. Kevin Garnett signed for six years, hundred twenty-six million dollars, and they were like, "Stop!" <laughs> right? <laughs> this is about to get out of hand. He's like twenty-two years old or something like that when he signed it. Hold on, this is going too far. This is where we draw the line. The contract that is going to break the NFL and is going to flip everything up is if somebody gives Kirk Cousins thirty million dollars a year, which is entirely possible. Right? The market dictates what it is now. If Kirk Cousins is worth thirty-seven million dollars right, right. a year, what are you going to go tell Aaron Rodgers? Right. <laughs> right. Now maybe it'll just be for the quarterback market that this goes, but that is the contract that can break this whole thing because they're going to have to get all the salaries in line with that one right there, and they got to make sure that the next Kirk Cousins can't get no thirty million dollars a year. That's where this one is going to like get to be fought or whatever it is, but. The players very rarely have the leverage to survive a work stoppage. That's where baseball was different than everybody else. Their players are prepared to win a work stoppage. NBA players, maybe they can. NFL players, they don't, A, they don't make enough money. Right. Most of those cats do not make enough money. Right. And I know that sounds like horrendously offensive to a lot of people. But let's think about this. Say you're an NFL player. You're on a rookie deal, which most of them are. And the league on a rookie deal. Four years, like $2 million for that deal. So we're talking about $500,000 a year. $500,000 a year, a lot of money, sort of. $500,000 is a lot of money if you've been making money the rest of your life. So most people who make $500,000 a year, they may have started at 50, right. they got up to 60, yeah. 70, and then along the way they picked up a few things uh -huh. and they got a few bills, whatever their house is. But by the time they got $500,000 a year, they're probably living on the expense level than what they were at when they were all 130. Right. And now they're able to bank that money, they banked a little bit more money they had, they can do that. But when you're starting at zero with $500,000 a year, okay, got to get your crib, gotcha. Got to get a car. Now, you can go get a Civic, <laughs> you ain't doing that. Right. Especially now if you're a large man, right? And the reality of life. People need to know who you are when you show up. Right. Yeah. And people will be like, oh man, that's silly. But if we are in the game of capitalism, this is the way that the game is played, yeah. right? Like you need to know you're okay. So now you talk about the car that you're gonna get. Okay, we're gonna do that. All these other things. And now you got all these people who their whole lives have believed that once you got rich, you were gonna take care of them. And they think your five hundred thousand dollars a year is all the money in the world. And now you gotta go. You don't necessarily have to do a lot for them, but you're doing something. You're probably gonna buy your mama a house. You might get her a car. Whatever it is. Hey man, the bills don't stop because of your lockout. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't. And so when that time comes, most of those cats are not in a position to do this. So let's say let's say ESPN is gonna have a lockout for some measure of strike. Oh y'all good, right? <coughs> Straight. Uh, there's other people that do the kind of work that I do. They straight. That man working that camera, you think he's straight? Uh-uh. That man is like, hey, man, when are we going to get back to work? Right. And when you and when I come to him, and I'm like, no, man, you got to stand tall for this. Be fighting this. He's looking at me, and he's like, yeah, it's easy for you to say. And that's what happens in these in these football negotiations very, very often. And young people don't, you know, young people blow money. Like, that's what it is. Like, young, people, young people don't understand... Young people don't understand what what if really means. Right. They don't get it. Like think about all the times if you for those of us who have made it beyond our twenties, right? <laughs> How many times did you spend every dime you had under the premise of it's cool? I get paid on Friday. They say no thing. I'm gonna get paid on Friday. Right. And then you get paid on Friday, and then you run it down to the end. All right, I'm gonna get paid on Friday. Now imagine being an athlete, and when you get paid on Friday, you get paid a hundred G's. Right. Think of all the dumb things you would do if you knew a hundred G's was right around the corner, right? Because I get paid on Friday, no big deal. 
Now these checks don't come. What do you mean? I don't get paid on Friday. <laughs> Wait, what? They're not, they're, not equipped, they're not equipped for that fight. So you got these owners who are making money their whole lives and will make money their whole lives after the fact. They're ready for this all day long. You just got into some money and that money gonna stop. And you're telling me to hold up on these checks. That's how we wind up in these situations. The owners win them every time because the owner can win the time horizon. The owner can win the long fight. And they can lose some money along the way. Yeah, we won't play some games right now. That's fine, I'm still rich. We'll be all right. Then the NFL, the last time, this is the worst one. They managed to get it to where DirecTV still paid them that Sunday ticket money. Yeah. Mm. Even without games. Right, because they got checks. Like, this thing, like, yeah, we're still getting checks. There are no games, we're still getting checks. What check are you get? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Harris. Okay. I'm glad you keep uh, emphasizing the NFL. I am a retired veteran. And veterans, we make fun of the of national anthem because we know most of the time it's a joke anyway because of the America and its racism. But I have a question about you. Will Robert uh, the Goodell, mm -hmm. this NFL commission, is going to get $50 million? He asked for 50. He'll probably get 40. And his contract is still has another year or so in when mm -hmm. the average NFL player doesn't get a renewal contract like that. Right. Okay? So that's the thing I had to ask you, you know, about that. Roger Goodell, $50 million. Well, let me tell you what I think is interesting about Roger Goodell is $50 million. <laughs> as it's become a contentious thing. Not only did he ask for $50 million, he asked for $50 million, he has for use of a private jet for the rest of his life, right. and he has for lifetime health care for himself yeah. and his family. Wow. Which is the. And look, I'm not mad at him. Right? <laughs> Shit, I might go ask him for all of this. Up. <laughs> all right, look here. I'm gonna need 50. I'm gonna need a plane. What they do? Say no, right? Um, but there's an irony to what happened with Roger Goodell, though, is that Jerry Jones and these guys seem to hit him and say that they wanted him to work on an incentive-based contract. They wanted his money to be based on these incentives, and Roger Goodell was furious reportedly at the idea that they would ask him to work on an incentive basis for his money. He's been making incentives by and large, but incentives nonetheless. And I laughed because I was like, look at this. They treat you like a player. Right. <laughs> he realized in that moment, That's right. he thought those guys viewed him as some level of equal to them right. or as right. some indispensable part. Yeah. And they looked at him and they're like, nah, man, you a commodity like these other cats are commodities. Now, you part of our little crew, so we'll treat you better and pay you a little more. You don't have to use your body. But he thought that he had somehow ascended to this place. Nah, nah, nah. They look at you like the help, like they look at everybody else being the help. Now, the argument behind him on this is he is the CEO of a corporation that does revenues in, X, you know, in certain amounts. Therefore, this is the salary that is in line with generating revenues in X amounts, which is our whole greater question about executive pay and how it winds up happening, which manifests itself, by the way, in fascinating ways in the business world. Uh, ben & Jerry's, for example, I don't know if they still do this, but they have the hardest time at Ben & Jerry's keeping a chief financial officer. And the reason is there's something in the bylaws, that, in the paperwork at Ben & Jerry's that says that certain employees cannot make more than some multiple of any other employee at the operation, which means that they can't pay wages in line with being a CFO at other places. And being a CFO is an awful, miserable job that you have to pay a lot of money to do. They can never keep one because they're trying to keep the salaries, you know, in line to maintain a culture where, you know, they try, to, they, they try to be as hippie as they possibly can about their corporate life, you know, right? Right. which is you know, a little tough to pull off, but that's what they're trying to do. And so with Roger, Roger's looking at this like, yeah, this is the money that I should make. Y'all are balling. Why can't I ball? Y'all say I'm in charge. Why can't I be the one that's balling on this? Mm -hmm. And he's not going to get as much money as he is trying to get, but I totally get why it is that people would find it offensive that that man would make, like, how people are not offended that he makes that much money but get offended by somebody getting paid $10 million a year to beat his brain in is a completely different thing. That, that's mind-blowing in total to me. But again, people will root for a Roger Goodell against someone on the field who's probably a lot more like them 10 times out of 10. Mm. How's it going, sir? My name is Jimmy Smith, Jr. Um, my question for you is, what is your perspective on the Rooney Rule in the NFL? And to what extent should it be emphasized in college football? Because we just had Coach Sumlin have a winning season at Texas A&M, but he still gets fired. 
you had Charlie Strong at Texas, and then he had to go to South Florida. What is your perspective on the lack of black coaches in Division One college football, and the fact that we have this Rooney Rule in the NFL where we could interview minority candidates, but that don't mean we have to hire them. Could that be emphasized in college football? And if that is the case, do you think they will still play on the lack of emphasis of the Rooney Rule and whether or not would they still go find that loophole and say, well, we can interview these candidates, but that don't mean they're qualified for the position? Well, I will say this as probably the only Texas fan in the room. Once they lost to Kansas, I wouldn't try to hear nothing about keeping Charlie. <laughs> I wouldn't care if he had been my black ass daddy. <laughs> you gotta go. I, 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 that one, I don't know what they could have done to him, but I would have been like, yo, that's really messed up, but uh, let's see what this other guy has going. Um, no, you cannot get the rule rule in college. Here's why. The problem that you have in college is there is a budget, but what is the budget dependent upon? Donations. Regular people, regular, pay for these coaches. It's time to get somebody out of the contract. You go to your rich booster and you say to him, hey man, we need to get this dude out of here. He's the one who cuts the check. Or you need to go hire this guy. He's the one who cuts the check. So this is just purely functionally speaking. It's purely on function. How do you make that man write a check? You see what I mean? Like it's donations. You can't make somebody donate the money in order to make this happen. Now if everybody was operating off of state budgets, you know, stuff like that, then maybe you could pull something off like that. But the difficulty with these hires in college is the fact that somebody has to cut a check. That, that becomes the hardest part. So interestingly, Charlie Strong in Texas, part of why it was difficult for him was the athletic director at the time made the decision that he was going to hire Charlie and he did it without talking to the boosters. Now, if he had gone to the boosters, would the boosters have given him the money? I don't have an answer for that. But he didn't go through the boosters. And then what do the boosters do? Make life hell. Because the boosters are the ones that effectively have that power in order to do it. So there is a market. There are, there are a lot of institutional and structural failures of college sports as it's set up that make it very difficult for the hiring of whoever the black coach happens to be, particularly in football. Because what you'll also find in college sports is seemingly racist dudes. They don't mind hiring the black basketball coach. Sure don't. Because yeah. <laughs> they think that you need one to relate to them. <laughs> so when Charles was at Texas, what Ray McCombs, uh, is a car dealer in Texas, he's owned the Minnesota Vikings, he's owned Spurs. He hired John Lucas as a basketball coach in San Antonio and was quoted on the record back then to explain his belief that you need a black coach to be able to talk to these black dudes. Right? So it's funny like how exactly it works. In football, what they do is you get a young black dude on staff, and he is your black people whisperer who goes to their houses, goes to their houses and when they got problems, make sure that everything is okay. Like there's somebody on the payroll whose job that is. But you can't make somebody cut that check in college in order to do this. I don't like I don't have a solution to the college problem. Now the Rooney rule I find interesting in the NFL is people forget the way we got the Rooney rule was Johnny Cochran threatened to sue these jokers, um, and they didn't want any parts of that. And so they decided, okay, this is how we're going to figure this out. We're going to you know, put this rule in that requires you to interview at least one so-called minority candidate. I got issues with that word for another day. But they put that rule in place to then make it happen. People are mad at the mandate of an interview. It doesn't require that you hire any bias. Just the simple mandate of an interview. But I think the Rooney Rule has actually been far more effective than people give it credit for being. The problem isn't the rule, the problem is the people. The rule is not, the rule is there because of the people. And we have seen, I think, quite a few examples of what has happened. Guys that ordinarily would not get interviews are now at least getting their faces in places and making people tell them no. So, Mike Tomlin, for example. Does anybody know the story about Mike Tomlin and the Miami Dolphins? Too hip hop? <laughs> Dan tells the story all the time. They thought about hiring Mike Tomlin for the Dolphins before he got that job with the Steelers, like the year before. They thought he was, and I quote, too hip hop. <laughs> yeah. Too hip hop. That is why he did not get that job. He then gets the job with, of all people, the Steelers, like the least hip-hop operation. That you <laughs> but what wound up happening was, Tom was a young dude. Nobody really knew anything about him. They needed to call some black dude in to talk to for one of these interviews. And boom, now people knew about him. And it went from there. Um, and this race thing is funny in that way. John Elway, 
John Elway, who's writing letters for Neil Gorsuch on company letterhead. John Elway hired a black dude to be the head coach of the Broncos, mm -hmm. who appears to be utterly unqualified. Sure does. Yeah. And he hired him. You, you see what I mean? So like, these, these things are not absolute. But I do think that the Rooney Rule has put people in some positions where they're getting some calls. Now the problem wound up with the Rooney Rule is everybody calling the same black dude. Because they don't actually <laughs> care about the spirit of what the rule is. Right, right. Like, you can use this rule in a way to learn a whole lot about it. Or, as it was for a stretch, everybody calls Leslie Frazier. Leslie yeah. Frazier called and <laughs> blow it up, right? Nobody else, is, nobody else is getting any level of call. They call the Fritz Pollard Alliance that's run by John Wooten. That man winds up having way too much power because he becomes the black man that the white man calls. They're like, yo, he's black people. Who do you call? Well, here's my list of black people. Think about how much power that gives you if you that dude. Yeah. You are the gatekeeper to blackness in the coaching world because you are one black man that they have decided because this is how this works historically, right? Yeah. Give us one and we'll talk to him. Yeah. That is the one that they decide to listen to and then it winds up, you know, that's how it goes. That's how it gets spread out. But I think the rule has done a lot of good for a lot of people. The rope is still short for black coaches. Like all of those things exist. But the problem, and never fall for this, is like, what a rule, a rule, rule ain't doing nothing. So, do you, and ask those people, so do you think it should be a stronger rule? But hey, 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 wait a minute, that's not what they want. They want to get rid of the rule. You know what happened? They get rid of the rule. Same thing that's happened everywhere in the United States when they got rid of affirmative action. It'll go right back to what it was yeah. before. Yeah. Um, I just want to know your thoughts on the whole LeVar Ball and the Andrew Ball situation. And do you think that it like put a net on his plans to game in the NBA? Well, that boy is never going to play in the NBA anyway. Uh, he's not that good. Like, that, that's the issue with him. Uh, Lonzo is the one that's a star. The youngest boy maybe has a chance, but that middle boy is the Vanessa Huntsville of that group. Like, the likelihood of him making the NBA is very low. Uh, and no, that would not be the thing that holds him up for the NBA. It's the NBA. This, look, it, it, here's my thing on that. I don't care. Look, Leandro Ball is like 6'5". One of them boys is like 6'7 or 6'8". The other one is 6'10". They are black. <laughs> and you thought that you could steal from them all. <laughs> no. Nobody was going to notice you three guys. <laughs> Nobody was going to pay you guys any extra attention. Nobody was going to do any of those things. And these dummies went in there and tried to, like, actually steal, like, expensive stuff, right? Yeah. And they thought they was going to get away with That's my number one. Like, I view that like I would if I were a parent. Where I'm just looking yeah. at you like, what? <laughs> like, all they were missing was weed in their pockets to completely <laughs> the what was on their mind. You know, the issue. But I do think this thing happens in, in situations like those where, we're like, oh my God, it's China, right? No, you don't want to get caught still in China. It's probably not a great idea. What if I can send a boy to jail? You make a time for that. Right, like that wasn't, well, you could have a, you know, the minimum sentence is three years. You think they'll plead things down in China too? Like to a degree, like they were never going to get any actual real trouble behind that, I don't think. But that was among the dumbest things that I ever think of anybody ever doing in life. But 18 does dumb things. You know, like I, mean, I can't. 18 does dumb things. Yeah. That I can say. Hello. Um, can you? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in the professional world, we're often tested. So, in your line of work, how do you handle criticism, especially from your own? And have you ever been expected to be a puppet? And if so, how did you resist that? So, how do you maintain your composure on the daily? Well, I mean, I don't think anybody. Oh, he's like called me a puppet before, but I mean, I'm better than that. Right, and one thing about that too, somebody calls you something like that, you can't fight that one so hard. You uh, you kind of wind up telling on yourself in that point. Who you know, oh, no, 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 whatever. Now, what was the first question? Um, how do you maintain your composure? How do you resist? Uh, well, you know, uh, one of those things I can discuss later, not in front of people, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing about it for me, by and large, is people don't know me, man. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't, they don't, they do not know me. And so there's very little that someone who does not know me can say that is going to legitimately and truly offend me. Um, like, so if my parents, for example, had some measure of judgment or problem with something I was doing or the way that I comported myself, I'm taking that like with a measure of seriousness. That's what it's going to be. But overwhelmingly, 
the opinions are strange you can only do so much with it. Now, you have to be honest with yourself, though, and listen to people and recognize that somebody is giving you a point that is worth listening to. Now, social media has made this bad in the sense that everybody in their mom can fire something off to you. So when I first started doing this, email was the way that people got in touch with you. And before that, it's letters to the editor. Yeah. Like, one of the coolest things with my dad, my dad found this. You know, he's, he's from a little town called Oakdale, Louisiana. He used to get, like, the, all the black papers of the day back then. And not once but twice, he managed to get letters in the Pittsburgh Courier. And it's like, he found these later years, like, the coolest thing in the world to have that. But when it had to be letters to the editor, they were far more thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And they were from people who were invested in a different sort of way. And so I used to read every email. And of course, they'd be the people who just called me whatever name it was. But there would often be very thoughtful people who would give me legitimate critiques of the things that I was saying. And as someone who was 20, 21 years old, like those things were very, very helpful. It's harder to wade through all that now. Because people are just firing off these quick things and they're coming back at you. But you have to be, I think, honest enough with yourself to recognize the things that you might have gotten wrong and the people who are around you that whose opinions that you trust who are willing to tell you where you have erred and where the mistakes are that you have made. But you know crazy when you hear crazy. And I think that to yourself though, you have to be sincere and honest enough with yourself to know you're not always going to get this right. And sometimes you're going to write about things where other people know more than you do. So for me, honestly, one of the most helpful things I had was when I started doing local radio in North Carolina about sports team, because I wasn't from there. I'd been there like four or five years, but I wasn't from there. So those people have been paying attention to those teams forever. They knew those teams. They knew more about those teams than I did. So it would be times where I would have to shut up and listen when they called in and explain things to me, because I didn't know how it worked. So when you don't know what you're talking about, which is going to happen from time to time, you got to be willing to listen to somebody who might know a little bit more about that. When you do know what you're talking about, you got to be strong enough to be resolute in the things that you know, and also recognize when somebody tells you, so be like, oh, okay, cool. Like, so for me, I think a general rule to have in producing content, and this is my most important thing, and not everybody will appreciate this, and I recognize what it is, but this is a promise I can make to people no matter what. I will never present you with an argument that I myself would not listen to. Like, I will never present you an argument that I myself would not believe. That's the respect that you owe to the people who are on the other side of you, is that I, if I wouldn't buy this, I can't come sell it to you. Because then I'm conning you. If I'm telling you something that I would not believe, it is by definition a con. Right? Like, I believe that you will fall for this shit. I will, but I believe that you will fall for it. And starting from that position, I'm not going to be so bothered by whatever the criticism is that somebody has because I know within my heart of hearts that I am not telling you anything that I would not myself be willing to listen to. And I think just as a general rule for dealing with people, that'll get you a long way and that'll keep you out of a whole lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Just don't tell people things that you don't believe. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Thank right you. Back. Um, can you talk a little bit about your upcoming show and your <laughs> co host Sure. I will be doing a television show that I believe will debut in April uh, with my buddy Pablo Torre. Uh, we will be on 12 to 1 Eastern, five days a week. Um, and we haven't really like fully started, right? Like This is where I'm lucky. Uh, I'm working with people on this show that I absolutely trust. So the man that's behind the show, when he tells me that the show is ready, I'll show up. And I'll be like, okay, this is what we're going to do? Okay, that's what, that's what the show's about to be? Cool. We are going to do that. And I am excited. Like, I'm, I am really, really looking forward to doing the show if for no other reason than I've had a lot of ups and downs in my career and in kind of navigating what the career, you know, what it is. And I caught a lot of L's in the course of this, but I made, I made a decision. I worked for ESPN in 2007, and they did not renew my contract, which was in effect being fired. And that was the only job I'd ever wanted specifically. Like I wanted that job at that place. And then I didn't get it and it was kind of hard on my confidence after the fact, after I did not get that job. Maybe after I lost that job. And I operated from this premise of, all right, well I'm never getting back to the show again. Like I was at a low level at the show. I got there and they determined that what I did wasn't good enough. I'm never gonna go back to the show again. And I was fine with that. I decided I'm gonna kick it how you kick it when you're not gonna be at the show. 
You know, I'm going to do these things a certain way that is going to be for me. This is not with the goal of trying to get to a place. I'm going to do the kind of thing that I want to do. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a few years from there, and I'm now, this is six years from there, they offer me the chance to go on to Highly Question. And so I've been doing around the horn there, but that's just like freelance and stuff. And I was like, well, what got me back to the show was trying not to get back to the show. So I'm going to kick it the way I kicked it before this, mm -hmm. because this is what got us back here. And they never once told me to stop. And so I kept kicking it that same way. And then I got on the radio a couple of years later, and I kept kicking it the same way. And now, a couple of years past that, they're talking about a television show where I'm kind of the starting place of that, and then they build everything else around that. And so for me, we still gonna kick it the same way. By the way, speaking of radio, before I forget, would you please stand up, sir? This is my good buddy, DJ Mike Hitman. If any of you listen to our radio show, that is that. I can say in all honesty, I'm not sitting on this stage or a lot of the things that I've done without Mike on the show, calling the contributions, the most entertaining and fascinating human being that I have probably ever met in my life. And we are like real life friends since my mama games on the week. And so thank you, sir. No, it was you, Bo. Hey, Bo, I want to ask you something. When you do your show, The Morning Jones, The Right Time, who prep your shows for you? Do you do that? Because I know when I leave the clothes, I was getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> the radio show. I'm like, how is he prepping these clothes this show so early? So most of y'all might have been part of some of my clubs. Y'all probably did the 50 Y'all Land, yeah. the 939, Brothers Palace, the Sugar Shack. Uh -huh. Some of y'all probably, I'm 53 years old, some of y'all might know the club, some of y'all don't. Like, I know these two don't know them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just gonna ask you, how you prep your show, man? And it was just amazing to come on the radio every morning, daily. I was a daily faithful, subscribe to uh, to his show. But the, the reason I got on his show, I could play because I bought a new car. The Sirius Radio didn't work. I got on his show, complaining, and Sirius Radio, we called them up. Ah. I called them up person on his show, talked to the CEO. He sat me up for two years, and that's how I got to listen to his show. Ah. If you ask for something, you can get it. Don't just buy something, don't, don't demand nothing. Right. I called the person on his show. So if, just like you go to school, Ask for something. Yeah. I always ask for something because you never know. Somebody got benefit. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, about prepping the show, it's evolved over the years. Like when I was doing The Morning Jones, the content was pretty much all coming from me. And I would ask that the support staff to kind of beef it up, like around, you know, in case I couldn't come up with something, but I was pretty much doing all of that. My time's a little shorter now than it used to be. And so Shannon helps me come up with a lot of the things now um, that we come up with on the radio, TV. We have a whole production staff, and that'll spoil it. But by and large, I'm like I'm asking for people to like give stories and ideas and stuff like that. But like the content generation in its final form typically comes from me. But a big part of it is part of why I engage on social media in the way that I do is that I have a lot of listeners who I think have a really good eye for what's interesting and a good eye for what it is that I am into. Um, if I'm not mistaken, my man in the back corner has sent me quite a few things to get the show ready. Or are you somebody else? No. <laughs> I'll tell you how I made that mistake short. Yeah. But no, a lot of people like send in these things and then once I find them interesting, so like the work I've done has been based around community as much as anything else. Like True Story, 2011, me and like a dozen people um, from that listen to the radio show, we came to Chicago to party with Mike. At his birthday party. And it's it's the great the contributions come like that. And so, you know, I'll take it wherever it comes from. This is the last question. Uh, do you think that college players should be compensated like if they knocked off a championship after they graduate from school, you know, get some type of money, monetary or reward? Yeah, I mean, anybody that works get paid. Yeah. That's the only place in the world we ask people to work and don't pay. <laughs> Literally, like you name anywhere else where we're like, well, you know, we're gonna pay, we're gonna pay you with the thing. What's that thing? <laughs> Education. Well, what that tastes like, right? You know, like that's the only place where we talk about doing this, and it's all about maintaining an aesthetic narrative that makes people like feel better about it. Something to keep in mind, though. They've done plenty of research on opinions, 
as it relates to college athletics? Mm -hmm. The greatest correlating factor to an opposition to paying college athletes. A distaste with life. That is the correlating factor. That is not an economics issue there. It is a race issue. To me, it is a civil rights issue. The way that we treat college athletes is absolutely a civil rights issue. And I feel like there will be some measure of change that comes from it if people view it as such. But I don't think that people realize what a truly civil rights issue it is. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Bomani Jones a round of applause. Can we come up and uh, take a group picture with uh, Bomani, those who are interested? Come on up and take a group picture. Come on.